of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show. Today, bringing you another really awesome guest uh, involved in a, a really unique project uh, that's going to create a better tomorrow for many people out there. Uh, today, we're, we're headed back to our friends at the uh, Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health, also known as ARPA-H, and, and we're going to be talking uh, with Dr. Calvin Roberts, uh, who serves as program manager uh, for their Transplantation of Human Eye Allografts program, or THEA, uh, which aims to transplant whole human eyes, ultimately to restore vision in patients who are blind or visually impaired. Uh, by reconnecting nerves, muscles, and blood vessels uh, of whole donor eyes to the brain. Uh, Dr. Roberts joined ARPA-H in uh, September of 2023 from Lighthouse Guild International. There he was a president and CEO running that organization, which provided programs and services uh, to people who are blind or visually impaired. And previous to that, Dr. Roberts was the chief medical officer for the uh, global eye care company Bausch & Lomb, and for 40 years served as clinical professor of ophthalmology at Will Cornell Medical. Medical Center uh, has been involved in, in over 10,000 cataract surgeries and 5,000 refractive or corneal surgeries, credited with numerous uh, technologies that he's developed in terms of different surgical therapy techniques, OTC products for vision care, as well as innovative treatment regimens. Uh, he received his medical degree at Columbia, completed his internship in uh, ophthalmology residency at uh, New York Presbyterian, and then conducted cornea fellowship at uh, Massachusetts Eye and Infirmary and the, the Shepherd's Eye Institute. We're honored to have with us today. A lot of really cool themes to get into today. Dr. Calvin Roberts, thank you so much for taking time to go on the show. Oh, Ira, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, our, you know, as doctors, we transplant hearts, we transplant livers, we transplant lungs, we transplant kidneys, we transplant skin, we certainly transfuse blood. Why don't we transplant eyes is what you would need to do to transplant brains. And so it's hard. So it's really, really hard. But that's what we want to do at our page. We want to tackle programs and projects and things that are really hard. Because if we're successful, it could just make a major improvement in healthcare for everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it's interesting because, you know, one of the things that... Um, you know, you point out on the Thea program, and and we'll connect to it uh, uh, in the bio of the show. Is sort of this whole um, concept that for the last decade, many decades, as a sort of ophthalmology and ocular pharmacology has developed. We've gotten pretty good at focusing at the front of the eye, and you've published extensively on on antibiotics and NSAIDs and steroids and immunosuppressants. Um, we haven't been as great as getting things sort of to the back of the eye. Uh, you know, we've developed VGF uh, antibodies and played around with stem cells and so forth. Talk a little bit about how sort of throughout your career, you've sort of seen this um, development or actually lack of development of our ability to to do really more impressive things in sort of that back area where the Thea program is, is going to be focusing. No, I probably no one knows better than you the fact that zebrafish can regenerate their eyes, but humans can't. And the most common causes of blindness in this retinopathy and diabetes, uh, I'm sorry, diabetic retinopathy and macular de de degeneration. And so those three constitute just the lion's share of people who are blind today. And all of them are back of the eye type of conditions. And so we've come up over the years 
with therapies to try to slow down the progression of disease. But we don't have anything that is disease altering. That means there's, there's nothing out there that can stop macular degeneration. There's nothing there that stops diabetic retinopathy. There's nothing there that stops glaucoma. The best we can do is slow down the progression such that it doesn't cause them to go blind. But despite all those medications, unfortunately, we do have people who are blind. There are also people with some rare genetic eye diseases that cause blindness. And of course, there are some people with horrific trauma who lose their vision that way. And so what can we do to restore vision to people who have lost it? Now, people have thought about artificial eyes, artificial retinas, um, artificial uh, ways of doing that, that it's, that it's an electronic problem that what you need to do is just convert light into electrical signal, that electrical signal then can go back to the brain and, and be vision. So when people ask me that, I always remind them that in 1964, NIH, so that's, what is that, oh, 60 years ago, 60 years ago, NIH came up with this initiative to create mechanical hearts. And in 1982, the Jarvik II, was the first mechanical heart that was implanted. And 42 years later, there's not a single person walking around with a mechanical heart. That, that human heart transplants are still uh, the standard of care. And at least for the time being, that's how I feel about eyes. That yes, maybe eventually we will have an electronic eye or mechanical eye. And it's important that we work on it. But I really believe that for the time being, our best opportunity is going to be with a human eye transplant. And, and hence why you're at ARPA-H now, obviously an, an extensive career in academic medicine and in and, and, and ocular pharmacy. Um, it's an extremely ambitious program. Um, I, I'd love to start up because, you know, you divide the the Thea program into really three technical areas. And I guess each of them is gonna have their own um, teams. One being the retrieval of donor eyes and, and ultimately how those are preserved. Uh, two, the, the regenerative medicine side. And then three, the, the sort of the surgical reattachment and all the, the post-operative care. Um, I'd love to start off with number one because you know I was doing a little reading before the show. I had no idea of just you know thinking sort of the, the corneal transplant market, uh, how many people are currently waiting for corneal transplants, uh, obviously, you know, that number will, I guess, a similar type of number once the THEA program is perfected. But what is the current situation with just accessing donor eye materials today? You know, how are they typically accessed? And, you know, what is involved in tissue preparation of an eye compared to, obviously, the other tissues we, we talked about on shows like a kidney or a liver or a heart? So fortunately, in this country, people are very, very generous in donation of, of their eyes after they die. And approximately 70,000 people donate their eyes every single year. Now, we, we transplant about 50,000 corneas each year. And so that in the United States, there is no real shortage of corneas for transplantation. And so that if you need to wait for a cornea, we're talking about days or weeks, we're not talking about months or years. So, so cornea transplants, there's a whole network of eye banks that, that have uh, arisen, that are collecting eyes, they're storing corneas for transplantation. What's so different about what we're doing than cornea transplantation is that Corneas will survive after someone dies for many hours. And so that, that if somebody passes away, and then you can have a discussion with the family, family and agree to, to donate the eyes, uh, a team comes in, uh, harvests the eyes, and we can wait hours to do that. With the back of the eye, with retinas and optic nerves, they only last for minutes after somebody passes away. And so that, and that's, it's a very different situation there because 
because here we're actually going to need what are called organ donors. And so these are these are people whose heart are is still beating, though their brain has stopped functioning. And these are the people, <laughs> these are the people who donate their hearts, they donate their kidneys, they donate their their lungs, they donate their their livers. And so that we will be retrieving eyes at the same time as the teams are retrieving other organs from 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 people who are organ donors. Now, so so we retrieve the eye, but we now we have to keep it alive and keep it functioning from the time that it's harvested to the time that it could be transplanted. And that could be as long as 24 hours until the eye gets to where the the the, the patient is and get the team together and whatever it is. So we, we're going to need to keep the eyes viable. Uh, for at least 24 hours, hopefully 48 hours, so it says in case there's some delay, that we're not going to lose this precious eye for transplantation. So that's uh, one of the areas of great concern. So how are we going to go about harvesting these eyes? How are we going to do this? How are we going to keep them viable? And then how are we going to transport them to where the, the actual transplant is going to occur? and uh, keep them viable so that the eye is fresh and viable at the time of we actually do the transplantation. Mm -hmm. And there's a step in between there um, uh, in terms of the repair and regeneration of, you know, what you're getting in that donor eye. Um, clearly the, and, and as, as you well know better than everybody, uh, lots of different types of cells that do all sorts of things. It's a, uh, the eye is an extremely complex structure. Um, talk a little bit about that, because I know, you know, in the program sort of overview, it lists things like cell therapies, gene therapies, other tools that uh, may be applied to regeneration, not just of the nerves, but of the different types of uh, cellular damage that may come in a uh, a, a transplanted eye. Talk a little bit about sort of the suite of, of, of technologies you're going to be looking at for that part of the program. Yeah. So, so, so now we, so now we have this this donor eye, and we need to reconnect it to the recipient. So, the most important, and there are a lot of important parts, but probably, probably think the most critical part is to reestablish what's called the optic nerve. The optic nerve is the nerve that takes the message that was created in the retina and carries it to the brain. And the brain then takes this message and interprets it to what we all call sight. So how are you going to reconnect this optic nerve from the donor to the recipient? So think about, you know, think about if somebody had their spinal cord cut. How would you reattach your spinal cord? In many ways, it's a very similar uh, type of question. How, are you, how would you reconnect a cut optic nerve, the cut end of the optic nerve from the donor to the now cut end of the, of the recipient? And so I can think of several ways of doing that. One way of doing that is in the area where they're called nerve wraps. And so what a nerve wrap would be, would would be a a physical like a band-aid that would go around this connection and provide a scaffolding or a means for the new cells to grow from the donor to the recipient in order to reconnect and make that connection. That would include growth factors and other uh, stimuli that would make cells grow at the same time as protect the cells in the in, in the in the interim from dying because they haven't been been attached second way of doing it is with electrical stimulation yep. so electrical electrical stimulation is the way the nerves grow in embryo that there is a potential gradient that exists as the eye and brain are developing and that the nerves follow this electrical stimulus and go from the eye to the brain and connect that way. And so can we 
recreate actually the natural normal thing that happens in embryos and now redo it here in this situation to make nerves grow in the adult eye the way nerves grow in embryo. So that's the second way. The third way, and the and, and that you pointed out, was in the use of stem cells. Now, mm -hmm. stem cells are interesting because they serve various functions. So one example, one way that would be successful is if we can have these, these stem cells evolve into nerve cells. Mm -hmm. And when they can act like bridges. And so you can see that you could put stem cells in the interface, in the connection area between the donor and the recipient. And the stem cells could reach on one side and connect the donor nerves on the other side to the recipient nerves, act like a bridge and create the reconnection that way. Interesting thing about, about stem cells is that stem cells also produce what we call neurotrophic factors, factors that cause nerves to grow. And so, and so that just having them there will stimulate the existing nerves to grow in addition to creating these bridges. Mm -hmm. And stem cells also have what we call neuroprotective or, or factors that keep cells alive. And so that and so that the stem cells will conserve that function as well. Now, what's the right answer? I don't know, but if I was to guess, it's probably going to be a combination of factors. Yeah. Yeah. So what we'll find is there'll be some kind of a cocktail, some combination of nerve wraps with stem cells, with growth factors, maybe a little electrical stimulation all working together that's going to create the best way to make these cells connect. Mm -hmm. Now, what makes it even harder still is that there isn't just one nerve to the eye. There are like five nerves to the eye. The, 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 you have the eyes, the, the nerves that cause the muscles to move. You have the nerves that cause the eyelids to open. You have the, the nerves that, that give sensation that if you ever had a, something in your eye and oh, does that hurt? Well, there's a nerve there uh, that, that's connected. And so we need to connect those so that you have feeling. Uh, yep. in, in your eye, okay? So there, so there's just one nerve. There are a lot of nerves. We've got to figure out how to connect all these nerves mm -hmm. in order to make this really, really successful. It's interesting, uh, you know, at the beginning, how uh, you mentioned the zebra fish and you know, uh, newts also have that amazing skill, what you're talking about doing this naturally. But a lot of what, you know, you're saying in terms of uh, stem cells and bioelectric uh, signals and morphogen gradients, I, I love the fact that you're, you're talking about it all because it clearly uh, is going to be multifaceted. And, and the fact that you're you're thinking of it all is, is, is really refreshing. Um, it's, it's say a couple of words, if you would, also about um, the sort of the post operative care because i know that's a part of this clearly you published a lot uh on as i mentioned at the beginning things like uh, immunosuppressants and steroids and such of that uh in 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 sort of uh surgical techniques in the past um what's your because you know we hear a lot about sort of the eye being sort of immunoprivileged where does sort of that sit with regard to you know these being obviously foreign transplants but obviously you can probably along the way play around with autologous stem cells, which will make them more, more self than not. What's your view on, on all that? Yeah, so fortunately, and, and in this case, somewhat unfortunately, eyes are very sensitive to any amount of inflammation. And so, that, and so that one of the things that we have to do here is we have to make sure that there's just little, if no, inflammation associated with putting in a foreign body, in this case, a foreign eye, into somebody's body. And so rejection is a big concern, but not even like a big rejection, but just like a little rejection is still a big problem. And so that what we need to do is have strategies in place of how are we going to, number one, make the recipient not feel that this is foreign, but that it seems like itself. And number two, to the extent that there is some kind of a reaction, 
with medication. So that this is a, a important part of this whole Thea program is how are we going to uh, how are we going to keep the uh, keep the eye healthy while it heals? Because the healing process is not going to be instantaneous. So that during that whole time, we're going to need to suppress inflammation, uh, whether it's medically, whether it's with some kind of um, stem cell reaction or something that is going to that, that's going to um, allow the recipient to tolerate getting a new eye in place. Let's um, let's talk a little bit about the uh, the other sort of opportunities that that spin off this because you know also you know one of the things you point out uh, because of everything you're doing here in terms of uh, regeneration and reconnecting and obviously stabilizing the whole system clearly there's proxies here for for various other types of, of nervous system damage including spinal cord injury uh, you point out just general brain repair um, and, and all the things you're talking about once again from from the stem cells to the bioelectricity to to everything that goes to making a brain look like a brain a spinal cord function like a spinal cord you're going to be learning in this program talk about some of that if you would because I think there's a lot of holy grail stuff <laughs> that goes beyond the eye here uh, in the thea program Absolutely, absolutely. So, again, what we would love to be able to do to stop eyes from going blind, to keep the brain from degenerating, to repair uh, spinal cords. And what I believe and my, my hope is that as we develop these therapies that help us transplant the eyes, that there's a translation or an opportunity to repurpose these new knowledge into um, other areas. And so that uh, the whole area of neurodegeneration you know, from the Alzheimer's on uh, is, is all situations that may, may uh, be the learnings from this program uh, help out. And so and you can see that you know, we lose function in the brain, whether it's from uh, strokes, whether it's from injury. Uh, the, 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 there, there are uh, so many causes of, of degeneration of the brain. And so how can we uh, stop that from happening? And how can we uh, damage that, that has occurred and how can what we've learned from transplanting eyes translate into therapies to help that? You know, that's that's the long-term excitement uh, from a program like this. You know, um, Dr. Ross, I, one of the areas that I, I did not mention that you published a bit on recently is the whole area of artificial intelligence uh, uh, and its use in sort of ophthalmic imaging. Um, you're part of this collaborative community in ophthalmic imaging at the uh, American Academy of Ophthalmology. Um, obviously, many different tools come to play in, in the THEA program. Um Love to hear just you know a couple minutes about you know, wh what the current status of artificial intelligence is in, in ophthalmology in general, and are there you know connections for using AI in some of these uh, procedures or some of as you're developing these different um, technology baskets uh, along the way to you know whether it's you know how to properly reconnect or take you know the proper stem cell combinations or whatever the factors may be and, and use AI to uh, sort of help out and across these processes. Well, so far, the great use of AI in ophthalmology is the ability to analyze photos. And so that what we have learned is that the type of picture that doctors take of the eye there's more information in there that doctors ever realized that you can look into someone's eye and be able to detect Alzheimer's or other neurodegenerative diseases that are going um, on uh, in the eye. What surprised me, and I've been doing this for a long time, is that until AI, I never knew that there was a gender difference uh, between people's retinas. I just thought everyone's retinas were the same. AI has pointed out the fact 
said men and women have some subtle differences in their retinas. And so there's so much information that, that we can get. And so AI is great at data, at looking at a lot of data and figuring out uh, what's important uh, in, that, in that data. Other uses for AI actually have, uh, have been in the area of helping people who are blind and visually impaired. So for example, there, there are lots of great technologies out there that help people who are blind navigate the, the street using GPS and other, and other technologies. They can find where they're going. But now you get there. Now you get there. Where's the front door? GPS won't tell you where the front door is. GPS will tell you where the house is, but won't tell you where the front door is. Well, AI loves to tell you where the where the front door is because you just take a picture with your cell phone. It's seen a million front doors. It'll, it'll direct you exactly how to get to the front door. Another use for, for AI um, is to help people in terms of, of daily living. For example, just reading a bill. So for example, when I get my utility bill every month, there's a million numbers about how many kilowatt hours of this and that that I've done and all this kind of stuff. But what do I really care about? I really care about two things. How much do I owe and when is it due? So how does a blind, how does somebody who's blind get that information? Well, AI would love to do that. So, so you just would take your cell phone camera, project, project it on your bill and say, how much do I owe and when does it do? And AI would read the bill, understand what it says and says, okay, you owe $83.42 and it's due February 24th. Right? So those are a couple of examples of AI and how it's being used in vision science right now. So then you ask the question about, all right, where are we going in the future uh, with AI? And so, and so that uh, the diagnostic area is really, really important. So as a screening tool, because of the fact that what we're trying to do um, is to get good care to everyone, to make it that you can screen for important health problems, even if you are not able, for whatever reason, to regularly go see a doctor. Whether they are in the local grocery store or somewhere that you can look into a machine and it will tell you that you're at risk of this disease and what you should go and look for help for. But that's, you know, very, very exciting. And that's a great um, application for AI. On the dying, on the therapeutic side, what it is is, is a way of screening uh, uh, molecules for potential drugs. Right. And that, and that if you understand the cellular basis of disease and you understand whether the receptors on the surface of cells, whether they are heart cells, or in my case, in retina cells or optic nerve cells, and understand where the receptors are. And then you, then you can screen just a whole library full of molecules and to find the molecules that are most likely to influence those receptors, therefore influence the action of those cells, therefore have a chance to reverse disease, and so that's, of course, the true, true, true uh, future excitement for AI. Um, so, Dr. Ross, I, I mentioned in the, in the bio, you know, you joined ARPA-H in September 2023. The TEA program was just announced a few weeks ago. Obviously, it's in the early days, but you know, clearly it's getting going now. Extremely ambitious. What, what's coming next in terms? I know you have different proposer days and different deadlines for for teams to to uh, sort of um, learn about the project, get proposals in. Can you just walk through a little bit of sort of where things 
stand as we enter 2024 and, and some of the, the deadlines that are coming up over the year for uh, the teams and, and, and your general role as project manager as, as these things are happening? Of course. Of course. So um, there's a lot that we need to learn. And there's a lot of different types of knowledge and science that is critical to make this work. And so we need we need the people who know how to preserve eyes. We need the people who are able to reconnect nourishing. We need the people do the post-op imaging with, with MRIs or whatever to watch the, how this heals. There's just so much different knowledge and great expertise that's going to be necessary in order to make this work. So how do you organize all those people, how do you get these teams to function? And so the strategy that we have developed is actually to ask the performers, to ask the scientists, to ask the doctors to form teams themselves. Mm -hmm. And so that go go and find the people around the country. You probably know who, who they are. And go find people around the country who have the complementary expertise that you're good at this and they're good at that and this other, this other group is good at this and put together your own integrated team mm -hmm. that you believe will make this work. And then therefore have the communications within yourselves. And so that we believe that's the way to most effectively and most expeditiously make this program work. And so what we are encouraging people to do is to put together teams, to think about all the different aspects that are necessary, put the teams together. And so we're holding Proposers Day as a way for people to come together, meet each other, figure out what's your strength, what do you need help with? What are the other areas? Put these teams together. And then what will happen is that we will ask teams uh, to put together their own proposal of how they believe they can make this work and send us this integrated proposal. And then we will land up probably choosing multiple fully integrated teams, not just one, mm -hmm. and let different teams work independently. And over time, we'll see which teams are, are successful. It may, may turn out that, that regrettably, they will have to down-select our number of, of teams and just support those that are actually making this work so that they're efficient. And uh, so that's that's our goal here. Well, it's a... Um... Very ambitious goal, and, and again, I, I'm I'm excited to see that it's all coming together in this way. And um, clearly, our page was set up to to do these high risk, high reward programs, and this is clearly one that uh, um, fulfills, you know, as we say, you know, um, creating a better tomorrow for a lot of people that require um, this technology. And uh, just again, glad to see you're working on it. Um, I, one thing I did not mention, I, I forgot to, and I know we're coming up against a hard stop in about 10 minutes, but uh, I'm in addition to, you know, your long career as a clinical professor in business, uh, in advocacy, uh, you're also a podcaster uh, and you have your own show on Tech and Vision. Um, say a couple words about your show. And, and uh, I was willing to this as well, but uh, uh, you're very much not just involved in uh, in these technologies, but you like to spread the word about what's happening as well, like we do. Uh, say a couple words about your show, and uh, are you going to continue to uh, to do it as you get into the <laughs> the depths of the Thea program? Oh well, thank you, because I'm I'm in general shameless when it comes to promoting uh, my uh, podcast. So um, podcast is on tech and vision, and in this series, what we do is we look at big, big ideas that people are working on that have the potential to change the lives and the future of people who are blind and visually impaired. Uh, my particular interest is in what we call assistive technology, which is technology that helps people who are blind and, and visually impaired live better lives um, at uh, Lighthouse Guild that we say that we provide programs and services that inspire people who are visually impaired to attain their goals. And part of that is the use of technology. 
and technology is great. I mean, if you have ever seen someone who is totally blind navigate an Excel spreadsheet, it'll, it'll blow your mind. The goal is to make people who are blind and visually impaired as professionally functional um, as people who are fully sighted. So that's, that's our goal. And so people are, are working on incredible things. And that's what we highlight um, on our podcast. Awesome. No, it's great. It's great that you, uh, you're you spreading the word. And obviously, a lot of those tools are, <laughs> are going to be nice segues into to what's going on with the Thea program. So no, it's uh, it's awesome that you do that as well. A really great story. I I, uh, I look forward to continue to, to follow it as, as it evolves in 2024 and, and the team start to come together. And it's going to be great to see where, where things end up in a couple of years with, with this new technology. So really very impressive um, set of programs, rooting you on. Uh, again, Again, for everybody that uh, is going to be listening to to this particular episode of our show uh, across the podcast networks or watching on the YouTube channel, again, you've been spending time with Dr. Calvin Roberts, Program Manager at the Advanced Research Project Agency for Health, focusing on the transplantation of human eye allografts program. Uh, Dr. Roberts, I want to thank you again for, for taking the time out of your schedule for a bit to come talk to us and introduce us to the program. Obviously, thank you for doing it. And, and as we like to say on our show. Uh, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow for so many people out there via what you're attempting to do. Really great story. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure. And I'm, and I'm so excited by your podcast series, because what you're really doing is making information available uh, to people about what the future could look like. Great having you. Thanks so much.